Good morning, this is Brian Reddish coming to you again with Spotlight on the Word. Uh, today we're going to look at the final uh, session uh, on the last days before we move on to the next part uh, of, of our book. Uh, remember we have been looking at the last days, we've been looking at the time when Jesus shall come or we don't know exactly when the time is, but we've been looking at what the scriptures say about it. Uh, and I'm just going to read to you this scripture, which is very interesting. We haven't mentioned this yet, and I want us to look at it this morning. Here we go. It's found in Matthew 24, 36, 39. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, in this final session on the last days, we, we cannot leave this subject without looking at these intriguing words of Jesus. When he likened his coming to the days of Noah, prior to when he flooded the earth. So, in doing so, we see from this passage I've just read, that Jesus did not mention anything about the wickedness of the day. Even though it was stated in the Bible, uh, if we look in the Old Testament, and we briefly will do, even though it's stated in the Bible that it covered the whole earth, wickedness covered the whole earth with corruption and violence. In fact, Jesus didn't go into that, and perhaps there's just one thing we could learn from that, that it's not always a good idea to dwell upon sin, upon the intricacy of sin and evil, especially in this case when they can be unspeakable, unedifying and utterly despicable. No, this is an intriguing uh, part of, of the message today we've got to look at. As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, what does Jesus mention here and consider? Well, first of all, he considers ordinary things in life, doesn't he? The, the normal things in life. Uh, nothing wrong with marriage in itself, eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And yet Jesus mentions this. I want us to look very carefully because what he is saying here is that these ordinary, it's not that these can be wrong, but these ordinary things can be a problem. We can be, uh, as you will see, uh, focused upon everything and anything but what God's Word says. And that can be just as bad as the wicked who don't focus upon God's Word either, but for different reasons. The common factor being if we don't focus upon God's word, if we don't hear God's word, if we don't listen and hear and believe God's word and be ready for his coming, we miss it. That's the common factor. And it's very uh, challenging. It's very uh, quite a surprise, perhaps. But anyway, it said it, this is a time of indifference. The, time, the days that Jesus are referring to, he, he focuses upon a time of indifference. Indifference, a lack of interest or concern, plenty of that around today. It cannot be regarded to them as a matter of concern. God's word is not relevant to them. It's a time of carelessness, wasn't it? Failure to give attention to avoiding harm and errors and negligence. Anyone who is careless usually ends up in trouble. They're not taking heed to warn. It could be anything. They're not taking heed to uh, the warnings that are, that are given. It's a time of preoccupation. So we've got indifference, carelessness, preoccupation with other things. 
uh, engrossed in other things, everyday things. Now, it's a strange thing, but these, this is the focus, and it may be surprising. Indifference, carelessness, and preoccupation can of themselves become ultimately so great that we completely miss everything in life that God wants us to hear and know that's important. These people before the days were missing everything in life. Uh, though they were marrying and giving and marrying and eating and drinking, they were missing everything in their lives that was important for them to know. And brothers and sisters and friends, it is important. Uh, what is important for us to know today? Yes, we have to, we have to do the stuff. We get married, we, 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 we do, we eat and drink and we do stuff. We go to work. But we do many other things. And if we're not careful, we can leave God completely out of the picture. And the very, those very seeds of that attitude can grow and grow and grow so that they become a massive obstacle. That is what Jesus is implying here. Let's just, just read it again. It's, in, it's quite intriguing. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating, drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until that day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man. People can die of ignorance, my friend, and, and give in to their ways of the flesh. They can. And very often people have said to me, people don't go to heaven because they're good. And they don't go to heaven, hell because they're necessarily bad. It is purely, we go to heaven by the grace of God. We have to, we have to uh, listen to his word and receive his word of forgiveness. And that is the message for the righteous or the unrighteous so-called in this world. But I want you to see that these seeds of indifference and carelessness grew and grew and grew so that they were massive obstacles. Let's just carry on, shall we, and see if we can expound on this a little more. Now, the Bible in the New Testament has something to say about this carelessness too, you know. In Luke's Gospel 21 it says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with drunkenness and cares of this life. Uh, uh, it says in the, old, in the King James, Lest your hearts be weighed down with surfeiting and carousing. These are words we don't use today, archaic words. But it's a, it's a, a concentration upon drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now this, don't you find in Luke's Gospel, is very much a description of what Jesus was implying about the days of Noah. Let's read it one more time and listen to what it says. But take heed, so you've got to take heed to yourselves. Not because you of sin and wickedness, but taking heed, lest your hearts be weighed down with surfeiting, carousing, drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare. We saw that, didn't we? Like a thief in the night. Jesus is coming when we are not expecting it, and it will be a surprise. But those who are ready, those who are working and occupying till he comes, those who know him will go, because they know him. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What is, what is the, the, the word there that's very important is that will come to pass. That is uh, sobering. That tells us that there's no question that this is going to be the case and so what we're going to look at next is the days that were before the flood in the Old Testament you see Jesus is not revealed he's, he's in the context of him speaking about the days before the flood has concentrated on that aspect carelessness indifference uh, and so on 
complacent. How do you feel about the things of God? Uh, what does God expect of us? I'll tell you what God expects of us. He expects, expects us to be working and doing those things he's told us to do. Remember Jesus spoke a parable about a vineyard and the, and the master told it left and left them to it. And, and, he, and when he finally returned, he saw that some had done their business and were occupied doing the work that they were supposed to be doing for the king. Others had completely forgotten all about it and left it. And he said, oh, you wicked people, you have not done what was required of you, what you know you should have been doing. Instead, you've taken to drunkenness and wickedness. And he cast them out. Jesus gave a parable of the same description that we're reading today. What was it like before the flood? Well, we're going to go to Gen. I'm not going to focus on this uh, because I don't think it's good to focus on it, to be quite honestly, so bad it is. But in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5, 11 to 12, we read a little bit. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. The key word there is every, every intent of his thoughts, of his heart, were evil. The Lord said, it goes on, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. You know, just what reminds me just now is when, uh, if you remember, Moses went up into Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and it was 40 days and it was a long time. And the uh, people uh, complained and they, they said he's gone Moses has left us Aaron you craft us out of gold uh, uh, a calf an idol that we can worship that and and they did and they danced and did great wickedness in the sight of God, God he, Moses is up there talking to God good goodness sake and just down at the bottom there this is what they're playing about it you see uh, they had no word from Moses for 40 days it was a bit too much for him wasn't it but anyway, when Moses came down, you can see what God thought of it. It was considered great wickedness and blasphemous. And he threw the tablets down the earth up and swallowed all the wicked. Yeah, you see, similar picture, isn't it? When, when, when he came, when Moses, in this case, when Moses came, this is what they were doing. Hmm. We've got plenty of examples of the scriptures to see what people did. And what God did. This is what I like about the scriptures. If you read the Old Testament and so on. You find the good and the bad don't you. You read the evil that people did. And what God did about it. You read about some people who repented. You hear about some who don't. And you see that people who were supposed to be good. Turned out bad. And, and God doesn't hide all this. He tells us straight. That we may know. Uh, 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 we may know. Uh, and learn from these. And take heed. He says take heed to yourself. And so there are more things that happened before the flood uh, and there was certainly uh, sexual perverseness going on, which I'm not particularly going to go into, but you can find many commentaries and they will tell you what they believe it was. Uh, it was dreadful. And so much so was the sexual perverseness that God's civilization could not continue because of it. And he had to cause the flood because of the implications to the human race uh, through their pervertedness. So, Jesus spoke of the days of Noah in the manner he did for a good reason. You know, the fruits of... This is, this is the challenging part, but I have to close on this, and we're not going to go on forever about this, but it's important to know... I didn't want to leave this passage, this uh, topic... And took a look at these, what Jesus said about the days of Noah. And the fruits of corruption and evil originate in a life of utter indifference and rejection of the word of God. The fruits of evil originate from utter indifference and rejection of the word of God. You know, 
when we reject, when God's word comes to us and we reject it, think of Adam and Eve, when they reject the word of God, you are actually choosing Satan. You may not think so, but you are. Because you see, God can cover you and protect you through his word. But if you reject his word, that covering can just depart from you. And ultimately, if it's a lifestyle of rejection, that covering leaves you wide open and the seeds of the enemy will develop and grow in you far more than they could have done had you received the word. See, Satan can't do anything when you're listening to God. He can't do it. But when you, do, just as Adam and Eve turned, denied God's word, rejected it, so Satan's opportunity is legally there. And he came in, didn't he? He came in big time. Look at our nation. Look at our nation today. Later on today, we're going to have a, a revival prayer meeting at 11 o'clock. We're praying for our nation. And really, because we have turned our backs upon the word of God, because we have brought laws into the land which, did, which blaspheme the word of God, which, which work against it, we open ourselves more and more to wickedness. Attitudes, the seeds of carelessness, indifference and rejection of God are growing, but they've already grown much and in many places grown strong so that we see the wickedness that we see. Brothers and sisters, don't be, don't be taken by surprise. This is what happens. And so we have to pray for a revival, if you like. We have to pray that God will have mercy and move upon us that we might be able to speak God's word and just a few receive and accept it. If only a few, if only one ultimately will come, it will be worth it. Brothers and sisters and friends, this is the real deal. And, and so, you see, when these seeds of careless, when these seeds of indifference and rejection of the word take, take root, then we become careless especially we become selfish and license becomes the order of the day. I want to do this. I want to do that. Why can't I do this? Who says I can't do this? What's wrong if I do this? Well, the Bible probably says it's wrong, but you still want to do it because you rejected the Bible. Brothers and sisters, this is, what we, this is the reality. And beware because it's not always our blatant wickedness but it's a carelessness and rejection. You can talk to some very nice seeming, have some nice conversations, and I have done in the past, with people. And you go on about lots of things, then suddenly you talk about Jesus, and wow, their face, their countenance changes. Their heart puts up a barrier, and they speak uh, fairly abruptly, and the conversation is finished, and off they go. Who would have thought that? Thought that was a nice person. And their reaction to God, well, Nobody's business. Brothers and sisters, be not deceived. The heart is desperately wicked. It is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, it says in the Old Testament. Who can know it? Who can know their own heart? That's why God says, my son, give me your heart. My daughter, give me your heart. I will make you a woman of substance. I will make you a man of integrity. I will make you somebody that I can use in this world. Will you do that this morning? Give him your heart. Not just your time, not just your money, not just your work and efforts. Give him your heart. Because it's out of the heart everything will ultimately come, the good and the bad. The good or the bad, shall I say, not and. <laughs> and so... The enemy of our souls has only room to manoeuvre when we give him the opportunity to do so. In the last days, this will increase more and more, leading to the final intervention of God. God finally intervened in the days of Noah and brought the flood. God is finally going to intervene and send Jesus again. That's the way it's going to pan out, my friends. Are you ready? Well... 
You know, before we close, God has always called the wicked. He said, come now in Isaiah, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be pure and clean and white. In Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake his way. Come now, let the wicked forsake his way and return to the Lord. For he will have mercy and abundantly pardon. God calls the wicked. Jesus said, I haven't come to save those who think they're righteous. I've come to save sinners. Save sinners. You know, God has no problem. Sometimes the wicked can come easier because they know they've done bad things. The people who think they're righteous and, you know, they're not robbing banks and doing stuff, they they're very, can be very difficult because they think they're okay. And besides, it's my life, I can do what I choose. See, so the words of, of the attitude of the mind can be just as bad an affront to God than blatant acts of wickedness. That's a hard saying. No, Jesus said, I've, I've come to save sinners. And the, people, the Bible says, sin is ordinary people heard him gladly. But those who thought they were righteous, the scribes, the Pharisees, and probably many others, they rebelled against him and rejected him. Which category do I come in today? Am I going to be one of those who uh, really are admitting openly that I've sinned? I have sinned, Lord, have mercy upon me and forgive me my sins. I'm not worthy, said the prodigal, to be called your son. But God loved him and opened his arms and welcomed him. Brothers and sisters, if you want to get close to God, turn away from your sin. If you want to get God's love and, and, and power and, and, and strength on your life, turn away from wickedness. Turn to Jesus Christ. That's the answer. God's, don't get, make no mistake when Jesus is talking about these things. They may sound terrible, but right now is the day of salvation. Right now, God's arms are open to all to come. Lord, bless you. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at this part two, which is continuing, and it will, con it will lead into how we can live in these perilous times, how God can shows us what we can do and how we can live with his help. God bless you. Amen.